for sound, what we found out last semester was that the F0, the observed frequency, was equal to Fs, the source frequency, times this quantity V minus V0 over V plus Vs. Where, let's remember, V0 was the observer velocity, how fast was the observer moving. Vs was the source velocity, how fast is the source moving. And V was the sound velocity, how fast was the sound moving. Where we used a very particular sign convention, where if the objects were moving away from each other, the velocity, the source or the observer velocity, were positive, and if they were coming together, the velocities were negative. I'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, I want to just change this just a little bit so that we'll actually see something very similar to what we get for light. Let's divide the top and the bottom by the velocity of sound. So V over V, that will give us 1, minus V naught over V over V over V, which is 1, plus Vs over V. So we get this result here, Fs times 1 minus V naught over V divided by 1 plus Vs over V. With light, it turns out that it doesn't matter if the source is moving or the observer is moving. The only thing that matters is what is their relative velocity to each other. How are they moving relative to each other? So both of them moving together like this is exactly the same as them standing still. This, uh, the, uh, let's say the observer moving this way is exactly the same as the source, mo the source moving this way. Doesn't matter. Are they just coming together? Are they moving apart? Are they not moving at all? Let's take a look at what we end up with. For light, we end up with the result where FO, the observed frequency, is equal to FS, the source frequency, times 1 minus V rel over C. So it looks very much like this numerator up here, but without the denominator. Where V rel is the relative velocity of the two objects. How are they moving relative to each other? And we'll see what this means a little more specifically when we stick some numbers in. We'll do that in just a minute. And then C is the speed of light, as opposed to the speed of sound for sound, the sound Doppler effect. For light, the light Doppler effect, we have the speed of light. There is a condition in order to use this equation, and that is that we must have the relative velocity of the two of them much less than the speed of light. If they are actually moving close to the speed of light, there's another uh, effect that has to be taken into account, which we're going to ignore. So we are going to assume that the relative velocity is much less than the speed of light. And then we're going to use a very similar sign convention as we did with sound, that if the two objects are moving apart, their relative velocity will be positive. If they are moving toward each other, the relative velocity will be negative. All right, let's stick some numbers in here. Let's imagine that we've got Dr. Evil here shining the light at Professor Vile. And Dr. Evil is running toward Professor Vile at 2.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. And Professor Vile is running away from Dr. Evil at 3.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. Uh, notice that they are both very, very fast runners. Let's figure out what's the relative velocity. Let's remember that relative velocities are positive if away, negative if toward. So all we have to do is add these together using this sign convention. First of all, the motion of Dr. Evil, 2.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second, Black here. 2.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. Now, is this positive or negative? Well, notice Dr. Evil is running toward Professor Vile, so that is toward is negative. So we make this negative. And then Professor Vile, 3.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. Now, is that part positive or negative? Professor Vile is running away from Dr. Evil. Away is positive, so we add that part. So we have negative 2.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second plus 3.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second leaves us with a final value of 1.00 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. The final relative velocity is positive. Let's check. Positive. Does that make sense? 
Well, yes, Professor Vile is running faster than Dr. Evil, so they're going to be moving apart, away from each other, so we would expect this to be a positive final relative velocity. Very good, let's take this, let's take a source velocity, and let's stick it in here and see what we get. Let's imagine that Dr. Evil's light source has a frequency of 5.000 times 10 to the 14th hertz. This would be in the yellow range of the spectrum. We're going to do it to four sig figs and we'll see why in just a second. So what do we get? The observed frequency. What does that mean? The frequency that Professor Vile would observe. In other words, what would he see is Fs 5.000 times 10 to the 14th hertz times 1 minus VREL, which is 1 times 10 to the 5th meters per second, divided by C, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Multiply this out. Be careful, you have to divide this first, then subtract that from 1, and then multiply. And we end up with 4.998 times 10 to the 14th hertz. Notice, uh, I did this to 4 sig figs because it's a, it's a very small change. It's only on the last or fourth significant figure that we get any change, even with a speed of 1 times 10 to the 5th meters per second. They would have to go even faster than this to get uh, more of a Doppler effect. Uh, one thing to, to notice is that the frequency is lower, the frequency, the observed frequency, is lower than the source frequency, which means the wavelength is longer. This is a very, very commonly observed astronomical result when astronomers look at distant galaxies, the uh, wavelength is longer than expected or longer than something if it had been stationary. We call this a redshift. In other words, the light from distant galaxies is redshifted, and this can be determined from uh, absorption lines in their spectrum. You, you know where the absorption lines should be, and they turn out to be a little bit towards the red end of the spectrum. Well, what does that mean? It means those distant galaxies must be moving away from us. This is from the Hubble expansion of the universe, uh, that, um, that these distant galaxies are redshifted. Very, very good. There's one more characteristic or quality of electromagnetic waves that I'd like to talk about just before we finish. Let's go back to the waves that were made in this chain when we first started class. And we talked about if I were to move this end up and down, we get these waves that oscillate up and down, propagating through the chain. But what if, rather than just moving this end up and down, I were to move it back and forth and up and down and back and forth and all in any random direction, we get waves in the chain that are oscillating in any possible or every possible direction as they propagate through the chain. Well, the same is possible with light. When we were looking at our source, I, I asked us to imagine that this, this uh, charge were moving up and down in a very simple um, uh, sinusoidal motion. But what if rather than just going up and down, it were actually moving in all sorts of different directions in a random sort of motion? This is actually much closer to what the motion of charged particles actually is like. Even in a, in a current, in a wire, electrons don't just move in a straight line. They move in a very random fashion, bumping into things all over the place as they drift along, perhaps, in one direction. So the waves that are formed by these charges moving all over the place will actually be moving. The electric field will be all over the place, changing and varying in all sorts of different random directions. Well, what sort of effect does this have on the electromagnetic radiation? What kind of uh, waves do we end up with then? Well, let's just take a look. Let's imagine with the chain, if I were making a wave, and this end was, was moving all around in any direction, up and down, side to side, diagonally, whatever, that would make a wave where the chain was moving in every direction. But let's imagine we took this chain and we passed it through, imagine, say, two, two uh, pickets in a picket fence or something. Imagine these two pickets were very, very close to each other, and it allowed the chain to go through them, and it could only allow, it only allowed the chain to move up and down, but it didn't give it enough room to move side to side. Well, what would happen? As that chain went through the two pickets of the fence, the chain, with the oscillations all over the place on this side, 
this point here would only be able to move up and down and when the wave made it through on the other side the chain over here would only be moving up and down there would not be any motion side to side well the same thing happens with electromagnetic waves we can actually take an electromagnetic wave where the electric field is oscillating all over the place over here send it through something not two pickets of a, a picket fence but what is called a polarizer and then end up with an electromagnetic wave on the other side where the electric field is only oscillating in one dimension maybe like the the y dimension for example the magnetic field would then be perpendicular to that oscillating in the let's say z direction and then both of them propagating along in the x direction this is what's called a polarizer and when light goes through a polarizer we say that the light is polarized well i've got some polarizers right here let's take a look at that I've got a polarizer and hopefully you can see through the polarizer what happens is the light is coming off the screen off the board into the camera and when it passes through the polarizer that polarizer cuts down some of that light so it's not as bright you'll notice that if you look through the polarizer it's dimmer however what if I were to take another polarizer and I were to add it to the first one well it cuts down more of the light but notice what happens if I rotate these two polarizers so that they are in line with each other that would be like having two sets of, of fence posts in the same direction once the light went through one going through the other is going to not have any effect but what if I rotate one of these so that it is perpendicular to the first one it cuts out all of the light that would be like having two fence posts this way and then two fence posts this way and having the, the chain only go through the little hole right in the middle, it's not going to allow any wave to make it through at all. So in this case, it's cutting out all of the light. But if I rotate it some more, we allow the light. So light when the two polarizers are parallel, no light when they're perpendicular, and then more light when they're parallel again. And you'll notice that if I get these just lined up, then one polarizer doesn't cut out any more light than the, the first one did. A adding another one doesn't count, cut out any more light. What's going on here? Can we figure out just how much light goes through a polarizer? Yes, we can. 